Have you ever noticed that oil and water don't mix? They just really don't. You see something like this, and you could, you know, put something over the top, and you could shake it up and try to get that to mix, like vinegar salad dressing. Uh, you can get it to mix, and then it just settles out again, doesn't it? Why? Why does it do that? It has to do with polarity. There's something about the water molecules that makes them bunch together and exclude the oil molecules. And so the oil molecules are pushed out of the water and they sit up there. They sit up there as opposed to on the bottom because oil is less dense than water. That's why it floats. But they're being pushed out or excluded from the water. Let's look at what's going on there. Here's the Lewis structure for water. And we see that the hydrogen and oxygen form a single bond where there's an electron from each and they're sharing. And over here they're sharing as well but they don't share equally. Oxygen is an electron hog. It's like you give two little kids a cookie to share, and maybe one's seven and one's two, right? And the seven-year-old breaks the cookie, and he gives the little piece to the two-year-old, and the two-year-old's too young to notice the difference. Yeah, he shared the cookie, didn't share it equally. <coughs> Electrons are often not shared equally. We say that oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen because it's more attractive to those electrons that are being shared in the bond. Electronegativity can be defined as the ability of an element to attract electrons within a covalent bond. We measure electronegativity on a relative scale. Fluorine is the most electronegative, and they gave it, they just assigned it an electronegativity of 4, 4.0. So kind of like a grading scale. 4.0 is the best, the most electronegative, and everything else is lower than that. So the electronegativity of the oxygen is larger than that of hydrogen. And here's where I have another stupid chemistry land analogy. I think of the electrons that are being shared as being two little boys. And one little boy lives at the oxygen house, and one lives at hydrogen house, and they go out to play together. And they go back and forth between the houses and the yards. And at Hydrogen's house, there's a rusty old swing set in the backyard. And they have a black and white TV with a VCR and some old Barney tapes. And if you're hungry, you know, she's got some, some crackers. They're kind of stale, usually, because they're old. And a cup of water. They don't even have ice. Not, not fabulous, right? Over here, they've got the big plasma screen TV. They have all of the latest games. They have an in-ground swimming pool in the back. Mom will order you pizza. They actually have a soda fountain in the kitchen. Five different kinds. Where do those two little boys spend more time? They play at Oxygen's house more. Now, occasionally, if they're playing together, they'll go over here and say hi to Hydrogen's mom, or maybe he needs some clean socks or something, or you know, forgot something, but they're going to spend more time over here. And so this would be like multiple exposure film of where these guys are. They're over here more often than they are over here. It's unequal sharing. If the electrons are spending more time over here with their negative charge, then the charge density is going to shift. And this end of the molecule is going to be more negative than this end of the molecule. And so we use this symbol. It's the Greek letter delta. It looks like a lowercase d with a posture problem. d minus means a partial negative charge. It's not minus 1. It's like maybe 0.5 or 0.2. It's a partial charge and a partial positive charge. So one end of this bond is more negative than the other end. And that results in a dipole moment, a separation of charge within the bond. So. A covalent bond where electrons are shared but not equally has a dipole moment, and those bonds are called polar bonds because the ends of the bond are not the same charge-wise. One is more negative and one is more positive. The greater the electronegativity difference between the two elements, the greater the dipole moment, the more polar the bond. The bigger the difference between the amenities at those two little boys' houses, the bigger the difference in how much time they spend at each house. If the houses were the same, they'd probably go back and forth equally. Does that make sense? 
This is a table showing electronegativities for the main group elements. Here's fluorine at the top. We don't, don't even measure them for the noble gases because they pretty much don't form any covalent bonds, so we just leave them out. So fluorine is the most electronegative. This is the coolest place for little boys to play. And everything else is downhill from there. So this is another periodic trend. As you go across, electronegativity increases. As you go down, electronegativity decreases. The way I remember this is I picture this. Fluorine is at the top of the heap. When you get closer to fluorine, you get more electronegative. You get further away, you get less. If you have two elements like chlorine and chlorine that are identical, they're going to have the same electronegativity. This is going to involve equal sharing, and we say this is a nonpolar bond because both ends are the same. The electrons are equally shared. There's no separation of charge. You can also have two elements that are not the same element that have the same electronegativity. Let's see. Um, sulfur and carbon. Both are 2.5. So if you had a bond between carbon and sulfur, that would also be nonpolar. There'd be equal sharing. If you have a large difference in electronegativity, you can actually get the ion completely transferred, and then the bond is ionic. This house is so miserable that the chlorine house actually adopted that kid. <laughs> okay? He doesn't even belong there anymore. That's not his mom anymore. He's in this family now. That's transfer of electrons, and then this ion can go off if it wants to and take that electron with it. That's the extreme. Ionic bonds happen between metals and nonmetals. Metals are very low electronegativity. Nonmetals are very high electronegativity. In between is where you get this polar covalent bond. These are common between two nonmetals. Here we've got hydrogen and fluorine. The fluorine is the most electronegative, so he's got a partial negative charge, and the hydrogen is partial positive charge. So if the difference is 0 to 0.4, it's pure covalent, intermediate, large. Okay, these are nice for people who like numbers, and here's a different way of representing it, but those are are just guidelines, and it's a continuum. There's not just three camps. You can kind of be in between. But I think instead of trying to look at subtracting the electronegativities and stuff, I think it's more important to think, well, if I have two elements that are the same, they're going to share equally. That's going to be a pure covalent or a nonpolar covalent bond. If I have two nonmetals that are different, chances are good it's going to be polar. There's a few exceptions, but we're not going to worry about it. If you have a metal and a nonmetal, then it's ionic. So if we have iodine and iodine, is that going to be pure covalent, polar covalent, or ionic? Pure covalent, because those are the same. Of course they're going to share equally. Pure covalent. How about cesium and bromine? Are they metals or nonmetals or what? It's going to be ionic because cesium is a metal, bromine is a nonmetal. A metal and a nonmetal is ionic. How about phosphorus and oxygen? Polar covalent. These are two nonmetals, but they're different. So most likely polar covalent. Okay? So that kind of ties back to things we learned about in uh, nomenclature. Well, you can have a molecule with polar bonds, but the molecule can still be nonpolar. What? Sorry. Polar molecule has a net dipole moment, a separation of charge. Um, the polar bonds add together instead of canceling each other out. If you have a diatomic molecule, a diatomic molecule has two atoms. If that is a polar bond, the molecule has to be a polar bond. There's no other bond to cancel it out. But when you have molecules with more than two atoms, you can have polar bonds and a nonpolar molecule. Let's look at carbon dioxide. The geometry has a lot to do with this. This is a linear molecule. We looked at this before. Here, is, here are the bonds. 
oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. This is another way to represent the dipole moment. The arrow points to the more electronegative one. This is like the neighbor. Dad comes home. Where are those two boys? And the neighbor points. They're over there. The arrow points to the more electronegative. So this bond I think of as pulling this way, and this bond is pulling that way. Pulling opposite directions equal strength. Nothing moves. Those polar bonds, those dipole moments, cancel each other out. And so this is a nonpolar molecule. We can look at this in terms of vector addition. Um, if you remember that from math class, that's what we're doing, three-dimensional vector addition. Um, I'm going to kind of skip over that. Here we've got a water molecule. It's got polar bonds. But they're not directly opposing each other. So vector addition predicts that this is a polar molecule, and it is. That kind of goes over the different cases. Um, I want to get to the good stuff here. My shorthand method, my alternate method. How do you tell if a molecule is polar? You look at the Lewis structure. Look at the Lewis structure. It's nonpolar if both of these are true. If one is not true, then it's polar. So in a nonpolar molecule, there are no lone pairs, and the atoms bonded to the central atom are all the same, or they have the same electronegativities. This is much easier. Let's look at CH4. I'm just kind of cut to the chase here. So here's the Lewis structure. I'm not done yet. Here's the Lewis structure. Are there any lone pairs on the central atom? No. No. Are all the atoms bonded to the central atom the same? Yes. Yes. So it's nonpolar. No lone pairs, all atoms the same, nonpolar. If we switch one of these, make that chlorine, is it still nonpolar? No. no. Now it's polar because they're not all the same. OK? I'm, I'm doing this just to irk them. Let's look at nitrogen real quick. I also really want to finish this. I know, I shouldn't have taken so long with the balloons. Polar. Polar. There's a lone pair. This lone pair makes the darn thing lopsided. Vector addition is great if you can think about it. But all you have to do is look for the lone pair. If there's a lone pair, this guy's polar. Bah, that's enough. Goodbye. <laughs>